Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Welcome back to Sanders Theater for the inaugural symposium to honor the moral and intellectual legacy of Paul Farmer. At this time, we again remind you to please turn off your cell phones and pagers, and please refrain from any photography. We're also delighted to share that this symposium is now live streamed and recorded for all those unable to be here with us today. As you've seen in your program, you have an insert with all helpful information, and we hope you enjoy the symposium, and thank you for spending time with us to honor Paul today. Members of the Farmer family, dear friends, dear colleagues, my name is Salman Kishavji, and I'm professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. On behalf of Harvard University, I'd like to welcome all of you to this afternoon's symposium to honor the moral and intellectual legacy of our dear friend, Paul Farmer. Paul spent almost 40 years at this university as a student of medicine and anthropology, as a teacher, a physician, a professor, chair of the Department of, of Global Health and Social Medicine, chair of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and ultimately the Kola Kotronos University professor. And we must remember he did this while being a driving force at Partners in Health, the solidarity organization that he co-founded, and while working shoulder to shoulder in communities to deliver equitable health care. And he loved Harvard because he saw it as a place from which he, and all of us could repair the world. To repair the world through deep learning, through understanding and revealing the social forces that cause misery and suffering as a path towards justice. What is known in Hebrew as tikkun olam. I first met Paul in 1994 and in the ensuing years I had the opportunity to spend time with him in Haiti and Peru and Russia and many other places and I had the privilege to learn from him, see patience with him, teach with him, and the blessing of engaging in many, many debates and conversations with him. And as I process my own shock at his death, my own grief, and as we all process our shock and grief, we know that given Paul's singular focus on the struggle for health equity, if we were, if we were to delay in this mission of repairing the world, he would tell us to get back to it. And he saw the university, particularly this university, as a big part of the mission. After all, it was here at Harvard that Paul spent so much time teaching and learning. To repair the world is not easy, and in thinking about the ways that Paul approached this, one cannot help but remember his love for gardening. Paul was, to put it mildly, a gardening aficionado. He knew the name of every plant, and he took gardens very seriously. In fact, in every facility he helped build, he insisted that there be trees and gardens. But it wasn't just gardening for the sake of it. It was more than that. It was gardening as caregiving, as a way of ensuring that people who were sick were treated with the dignity they deserved. Gardening as a tool for social transformation. Gardening as a form of cultivation, both literally and, the mind, and of the mind. It was gardening as a way to start repairing the world. About 25 years ago, when I was with Paul and Kanj in Haiti, I commented on the beautifully shaded area near the entrance to the clinic under which patients were sitting and being fed. It was a beautiful space, you know, a respite from the burning sun, a balm for the weary and the sick. And Paul smiled and told me that it had been his hope that when people came to Kanj for care, they would have a place where they could get some respite. And that this waiting area had been purpose built for that, that it had been part of the plans. A bomb for the weary and the sick and part of the plans from the very beginning. That's the kind of gardener Paul was. And I recount the story today because I know that his academic writing, his profound intellectual contribution across multiple fields and his teaching, his life here at the university was one of his gardens. And with all the great things Paul accomplished, it's tempting to focus on the trees and flowers that he planted, of which there were many. But I think that Emma Klippinger, co-founder of the nonprofit Gardens for Health, 
got it right when she wrote soon after Paul's death that he didn't plant seeds so much as magically change the soil such that an entirely, entirely new ecosystems could grow and thrive. And she's right. Paul was building gardens of great complexity, and he was not just focusing on the large trees and plants. He was focusing on the soil, the richness of the soil through which transformational ideas would grow. And of all the elaborate gifts that Paul has left us, to borrow Jim Kim's words from this morning, of all the elaborate gifts, his intellectual legacy, which has already shaped the thinking of a generation of people across many fields and many geographies, is the soil of a verdant garden. It's a soil that has instilled in so many a drive for equity and a determination to build an entirely different moral ecosystem. So as we look to the future, it's essential for us to learn more about and learn from this profound intellectual legacy. This is what we are starting to do today. Paul has said on many occasions, poverty is not some accident of nature, but the result of historically given and economically driven forces. It's the result of social structures, social arrangements that are created by humans. And because of that, he called for rigorous scholarship to understand these forces and structures as a path to changing them. This type of analysis had to be historically deep, deep enough to address recent and distant historical antecedents to present day poverty and suffering. And it had to be geographically broad to understand the linkages between poverty in one place and wealth in another, and understand that what happened to the poor and vulnerable is linked to the exercise of power, locally and transnationally. For this, he turned to anthropology, history, and sociology, often buttressed by philosophy and a critical epidemiology. He saw these fields as indispensable to social medicine, to understanding health as both a biological and social phenomenon. He referred to these ways of learning, these methods of analysis, as the re-socializing academic disciplines. And we have to remember, engaging in academic analyses of structural driver, drivers of poverty and the solutions was not some side gig for our dear friend. This was serious work and required rigorous scholarship, which he modeled. Paul himself wrote and, or edited 17 books and over 400 articles and chapters. And he fostered and encouraged the rest of us to do the same. For him, the quest for health equity would need to be built on foundations that were experienced near, historically deep, morally sound, and that were carefully reasoned. And this is where the academy, as a space for intellectual search and rigorous analysis, plays a critical role. And how did Paul approach this type of intellectual search and rigorous analysis? Well, he grounded the work for equity in a number of ideas that he drew from scholars of liberation theology. At the foundation was a focus on preferential option for the poor. To quote Paul, any serious examination of epidemic disease has always shown that microbes also make a preferential option for the poor. But medicine and its practitioners, even in public health, do so all too rarely, end quote. For Paul, preferential option for the poor was both a moral frame and an epidemiological insight about who gets sick and who dies. It provided, it provided a sound underpinning for the struggle for equity. On top of this, Paul incorporated a methodology that shaped his approach to health equity. Observe, judge, and act. To observe means to observe the social order, the economic and political structures, the cultural practices, and the conditions of those who don't receive care and of those who deny care to others. It is to reveal the mechanisms through which social structures cause misery, to expose structural violence. If observing is done right, to judge means to recognize those mechanisms and take a position on it. It's a type of judgment that implicates and involves the observer. As many of you know, Paul's scholarship was not one of moral relativism. <clears throat> 
It was one that clearly made normative claims about what is good, what is right, and what is just. And to act means to go beyond the mere reporting of findings, to use the learned insights to change the world, to bend the arc towards equity and justice. And this, Paul often said, could be done through sustained partnerships with service organizations and through accompaniment at various levels of patients, communities, policymakers, and even complex bureaucracies. To observe and judge without action was something he would not accept. Such, such an enterprise, he said, quote, would not be an ethically sound venture. And last, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, Paul learned from the scholars of liberation theology the power of presence and proximity as integral to observation, judgment, and action. I mean, the liberation scholars themselves had lived in communities, listened to communities, and learned from communities in which people were subject to large and small-scale social forces that deprived them of healthcare, housing, and opportunity, and sometimes even life. And as an anthropologist, Paul understood the power of this experience near approach, the power of this type of ethnography. And for him, it provided significant clarity. In a, in a 2018 interview with the Harvard Gazette, Paul was asked if being a clinician and a partisan of patients clouded his objective judgment. Yeah, his response was unequivocal. He said, quote, I think seeing patients unclouds my judgment. Paul's emphasis on observation, judgment, and action reflected his strong conviction that it is possible to grasp, to understand what's happening in the social world, to measure outcomes of great import, and then to use this information to repair the world. But this could only happen if, to paraphrase his words, scholars bring the mechanisms of social processes into relief, expose unsound reasoning, and understand how social forces, how ideologies, work themselves into the lives and bodies of those who are struggling against both disease and poverty. I want to return for a few minutes to Paul's love for Harvard and his love of teaching. Students who knew Paul often remembered him telling them that they were his retirement policy. They were the reason he would even consider not working until his last day. In the introduction to a collection of Paul's graduation ceremony speeches called To Repair the World, John Weigel, a graduate of Harvard College who worked closely with Paul, wrote about his realization that students were protagonists in Paul Farmer's vision of a more humane world. This is why Paul put so much time and effort to nourish the soil at Harvard, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, and so many other universities, colleges, and high schools where he visited and taught. And to be fair, it wasn't just students. He saw universities themselves as important change agents in the world, especially Harvard. In one of his recent writings, a reflection on the 150th anniversary of social medicine at Harvard Medical School, Paul outlined a strategy for the future of the department that he had he had chaired for so many years, global health and social medicine. As I was rereading this piece, I realized that it could be read as a guide or a roadmap for universities in the 21st century. And given the predicament of our world with persistent and corrosive inequality, with climate change, the climate crisis, with the erosion of public trust, and given the, given the predicament of higher education, whose role in addressing the problems of our time as a transformational force in society and as a partner to communities is being increasingly questioned. I believe that Paul's guidance is prescient. This is what he said. Paul called on us to have a singular dedication to integrating varied disciplines, methodologies, and forms of knowledge in order to address disparities in its myriad forms. And certainly in our society and in our world, there is much to do to address poverty, the healthcare crisis, the housing crisis, the climate crisis, the energy crisis, the prison crisis, and so much more. And he called for us to elevate care 
including treatment of the sick and caregiving and accompaniment at various levels as urgent moral practices. This should be part of our moral education and the moral frame within which we operate. And he said that we need to engage actively in the pragmatic task of using our knowledge to reduce disparities through research, novel and diverse training programs, and sustained partnerships with service organizations. And of course, he said, we must be driven by the dogged pursuit of equity, guided by the lived experience and expertise of communities disproportionately suffering from structural violence in all its forms. That's the roadmap Paul sketched out. And I think Paul would have wanted all universities, but particularly our university, to embrace this. And it echoes what Harvard President Larry Bacow has been saying for many years, that institutions of higher education have a responsibility to work toward making the world fairer and more just. Dear friends, dear colleagues, today we join as a community to honor our friend, Paul, to laud his great contributions, accomplishments, and vision, and to learn more about the intellectual roadmap that he left for us and with us. Paul once said, to be horrified by inequality and early death and not have any kind of plan for responding, that would not work for me. Thanks in large part to Paul, it also does not work for many people who benefited from his scholarship, his teaching, and his example. And as we partake in this afternoon's symposium, we can and should give thanks to Paul for his laser-sharp insights and insistence that we do the rigorous work of understanding why inequities persist and then engage in the rigorous work of repair. Despite the sorrow of his absence, we can only be grateful that our dear friend, the constant gardener who ensured that there was shade for the sick and wary, also nurtured the soil here and in so many places such that his vision will continue to flourish long beyond his all too short time with us. And I will end today in the brightness of Paul's spirit with a prayer. May he rest in peace May we continue to learn how to observe, judge, and act. And may his memory always be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Salman, uh, for an incredibly moving and poignant overview of Paul's extraordinary moral and intellectual legacy. Um, my name is Marty Zeev. I'm an anthropologist and a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. From the early years of my graduate program at Harvard, I had the honor to learn from and teach alongside Paul, as well as several of his mentors, colleagues, and friends here today. There is much to say about this experience, but to keep things brief, I'll simply note, without overstatement, that it has been profoundly life-changing, and I am so grateful for it. Um, I was able to read the text of Salman's presentation a few days ago. His recounting of Paul's uh, reparative and transformative work brought to mind a line from Minima Moralia, Reflections of an Damaged Life, which was written by the German critical theorist Theodore Adorno during a period of exile in the US to which he fled from the horrors of fascism during World War II. Anguishing over the possibilities for ethical life in the context of a social order built on discriminatory violence and death, he observed, wrong life cannot be rightly lived. When our collective existence is structured in such a way that good for some is extracted from harm uh, against others, um, we are all, in a sense, damaged. To be human is to be bonded together, and the failure to honor those bonds and their moral imperative to care for one another disfigures our shared humanity. In such circumstances, the only path to an ethical life, to right living, 
for those who benefit from such an order is to transform it. Paul's life and work illustrates this truth so clearly and insists on its moral entailment through a unique vision of repair. To repair the world, it is not enough to treat the wounds of those harmed by a harmful social order. Paul did plenty of that, certainly, and it was an urgent and central and necessary part of his work. But he also saw, as Salman so beautifully put it, that we must work together to diagnose, dismantle, and remake the material and sociocultural milieu in which humans live and grow and flourish or do not. This, for Paul, is the foundation for a practice of social medicine, care for individuals and communities, reform the social institutions, policies, and power dynamics that inequitably distribute sickness and suffering among humans, prevention and care. His scholarship leaves us with the tools to carry on this work. Over the next two hours, you'll hear from an extraordinary group of Paul's mentors, colleagues, former students, and friends who have worked with him to build and to expand this moral and intellectual legacy. Given its astonishing scope, we will not be able to explore this legacy comprehensively today. Instead, this symposium will be the first in an annual series dedicated to honoring Paul's body of work. The presentations are divided into three discussion panels. Over, uh, the first will examine, examine Paul's elaboration of crucial concepts such as structural violence and immodest claims of causality to unearth and challenge root social causes of global health inequities. The second will explore his use of ethnography and history to re-socialize public health and medicine. And finally, the third will engage with his philosophy of accompaniment and a commitment to making a prefer preferential option for the poor, as these serve as the moral basis of healthcare praxis. Each panel will open with a brief initial reflection, uh, followed by a lengthier presentation, before closing with two shorter reflections. We are so grateful that you have joined us uh, today to celebrate and to expand on Paul's extraordinary moral and intellectual legacy and to continue his project of repair and transformation. Um, at this time, I warmly invite members of the first panel to the stage. Good afternoon. Um, thanks so much, Salman and Marty, for putting together this symposium and for the total honor and a pleasure to uh, offer a brief reflection. In 2005, Paul spoke at the Boston College commencement. His speech was also published in the book Salman and others have referenced to repair the world. In this piece, Paul borrowed from Thomas Clarkson, one of the subjects of Adam Hochschild's brilliant history about the British abolitionist movement. Paul described as turning road angst into action. Clarkson's experience of observing the injustice of slavery, embracing the discomfort that knowledge engendered, and converting that discomfort into abolitionist action. Long before Paul coined the expression, turning road angst into action, he lived the praxis it embodied and used it to build a movement for equity, to act against structural violence and its consequences. Paul recognized early that these social forces were so deeply embedded, ruthlessly protected and promoted, that undermining them required nothing short of a global movement. That movement would only succeed if it embraced the countless ways, or too numerous to count ways, people choose to transform into sustained creative action the agitation that many felt about structural violence and about the lived experience it engenders in its victims. Paul welcomed action against the roots and consequences of structural violence from any and all actors imaginable. These included the obvious ones who could bring direct succor, doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, the less obvious ones, 
for some, logistic and supply chain experts, social workers, IT professionals, policy wonks. He also welcomed seemingly unlikely allies to the movement, sports management and finance experts, architects, chefs, and of course, Paul invited into the movement a wide array of respected scholars. Paul and many of his esteemed mentors and trainees from whom you'll hear today um, in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine favored social science research that relentlessly exposes the roots of structural violence and represents the lived experience of individuals made vulnerable by these social forces. He also provided a space and unconditional support for my quantitative research to improve access to and the quality of treatment of tuberculosis. My research seeks to disrupt a consequence of structural violence, that of resignation or acceptance that each year a long curable, preventable, airborne infectious disease newly sickens more than 10 million people, kills 1.5 million, all while leaving a devastating legacy of new infections, disability, unemployment, starvation, and growing inequality. This work strives to permit people who live with or, at, or at, are at risk of TB to claim their human right to science, a right that is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in international law. In other words, and consistent with the early mission statement of PIH, Paul continuously supported my scholarship to grow and harvest for delivery the fruits of research that could be brought to bear on health problems disproportionately affecting the poor. This work began as observational studies of implementation in low and middle income countries of the then standard of care for drug resistant TB. When it evolved to clinical trials in these same settings, Paul's support was unwavering. He could e easily have rejected the work or dismissed it for its reliance on a reductionist model, for any alliance with the pharmaceutical industry, and for its engagement of vulnerable populations in tests of experimental treatments. Although Paul challenged me to confront these issues and to be guided by solidarity with and accountability to the populations we were committed to serving, he allowed and even embraced this work as a necessary part of the movement for equity. My colleagues, Joya, Mercedes, and Kim, leaders in the same movement, will discuss their range of scholarship with the common thread of disrupting the sources and consequences of structural violence to ensure a preferential option for the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I just want um, to say that mine is the lengthy one, so don't think I'm just being an air hog. Um, <laughs> Among the enormous contribution of Paul's scholarship was the creation, I believe, of a moral, new and moral framework for the philosophy of human rights. A philosophy that's an amalgam of his great gifts, reading deeply, walking with and listening to the poor, and taking action in concert with his moral understanding. Like Michel Foucault, Paul's philosophy was always linked to an extensive study of history and political economy, these forces that shape the social structures that oppress human beings. He understood Habermas's agency, but he furthered that to elaborate that agency is stolen from the pathologies of power the choices of the powerful. In Paul's philosophy, we understand the Kantian categorical imperative that through reason it is possible to define what is moral and good. But in Paul speak, we call that an AMC, an area of moral clarity. While triangulating with these philosophers, Paul's moral philosophy was always grounded in Catholic social teaching. In Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas's tome, he defined morality as both the cognitive ability to understand and render plain areas of moral, moral, moral clarity, excuse me, 
and the appetitive power, the will to act on this knowledge. However, setting the stage for this revelatory alchemy of these philosophical themes, Paul's greatest moral teacher, the teacher of human rights, the teacher that we all must listen to, is Haiti. Paul's study of moral philosophy emanated from his love and study of the history and people of Haiti, from his friendships with the country of and people of Haiti, the righteous struggle of the Haitian people for liberty, the historical and present day structures of oppression, and the incisive clarity with which the Haitian poor view the world. These are the cornerstones of Paul's moral philosophy. In his 1994 book, The Uses of Haiti, Paul wrote, the first order of business for citizens of the US might be a candid assessment of our ruinous policies toward Haiti. He went on to call in that book for a new solidarity, a pragmatic solidarity that could supplant both our malignant policies and well-meaning but unfocused charity with what the Haitian people are asking for, justice. Paul's moral philosophy was positioned at the crossroads of health and justice, positioned at the crossroads of a new era of human rights and articulated through a novel and progressive framing of the same. His scholarship shifted the focus away from the, government, from the bread and butter of human rights work, which is blaming and shaming governments for infractions of civil and political rights. He shifted this understanding toward the analysis of the global power structures and their violations of social and economic rights, the right to health care, water, food, housing, and jobs. Paul's proximity to the poor, especially in Haiti, gave his cognitive moral understanding the appetitive will to act. As he wrote in 1999 in Pathologies of Power, the destitute sick are increasingly clear on one point. Making social and economic rights a reality is the key goal of health and human rights in the 21st century, which calls for us not only to recognize the relationship between structural violence and human rights violations, but also to implement what we have termed pragmatic solidarity, the rapid deployment of our tools and resources to improve health and well-being of those who suffer this violence. He continues, local and global inequalities mean that the fruits of medical and scientific advancement are stockpiled for some and denied to others. And here we are, 24 years since the publication of Pathologies of Power, a pandemic sweeping the globe and a stockpile of scientific miracles on the shelves of empire. Both in the US and around the world, the risk of contracting COVID-19, the access to preventive vaccines and life-saving therapeutics, and the health outcomes of those who fall sick with COVID-19 map the structural violence of our global society. Black Americans are three times more likely to die of COVID-19. Only 1% of people in Burundi are vaccinated and children of day laborers in India are, are experiencing severe life-threatening malnutrition as we speak. Paul's scholarship on moral philosophy allows us to see around the corner of biomedical victory narratives and understand that social, political, and economic forces result in material, urgent, and violent risks for those who exist in a death world of global racism, gender inequality, and impoverishment. And he has handed us the antidote. 
in book after book, talk after talk, discussion after discussion, we glean from Paul, do something. Do something. Pragmatic solidarity, he says, the rapid deployment of our tools and resources to improve the health and well-being of those who suffer violence. If Paul's scholarship in anthropology, history, political economy represent what Aquinas called the cognitive moral power, then pragmatic solidarity is his antidote for this appetitive moral power or a will to act based on a rational understanding of this broken world. Social medicine from the late 20th century onward will be shaped by the moral philosophy of Dr. Paul Farmer. By promoting deep scholarship that delves into why, understanding why the world is the way it is, using historical and political analyses, a never-ending, fascinating, and often heartbreaking discipline, one which is critical for moral reason. What were the uses of Haiti? From the U.S. military occupation in the 20s to the U.S.-backed coup d'etat of President Aristide, and how do these events impoverish and sustain poverty in that country? By using the tools of anthropology, listening, observing, and even shutting up when need be, upon understanding that a mother of of seven has two sacks of maize until the next harvest, we can understand that taking medicine isn't the first thing on her mind. As Paul wrote in his 1992 book, AIDS and Accusations, AIDS was the last thing. Survival is the first. Thus, in constructing a hierarchy of human rights, we must put food, shelter, employment, and water, jobs, as the first things, the fundamental rights. And by the appetite of reason, the will to act, the practice of social medicine, the pragmatic solidarity, Paul's extraordinary canon has many approaches. But I will mention two, accompaniment and poser. From liberation theology and his friend Gustavo Gutierrez, Paul framed the work of social medicine and health equity as making a preferential option for the poor. That is, based on the understanding of historical forces and oppression, working with the poorest shall always be our AMC, our area of moral clarity, a rational choice based on reason. Approach one is accompaniment, walking with, listening to, and seeing the needs of the poor. Shoe leather philosophy, if you will. And approach two is human rights itself, is poser, what we call the program on social and economic rights. It's a program at Partners in Health to provide food, school, housing, and jobs to the destitute sick, to materially resource the human rights violations that are keeping them poor and sick, to a material resource, that which increases the risk of illness, the delay in care, and indeed the life or death of the poor. What Paul recognized is that the social and economic rights are the social determinants of health. And without attention to these, there can be no health equity. Giving food to the hungry, housing the outcast, giving water to the thirsty are areas of moral clarity. They are material works of pragmatic solidarity, and they will deliver the outcome of health equity when paired with modern medicine. The moral philosophy of our dear friend, colleague, and inspiration, Dr. Paul Farmer, is living and breathing. It lives in the students he trained in the United States, in Haiti, and Rwanda, and around the world. These students who now read Foucault and Weber, Fanon, Khashoggi, Brandt, Kleinman, Good, and of course, 
armor. It lives in doctors and nurses who have learned to walk with community members, community health workers, patients, accompanying one another, listening and learning about how and when pragmatic solidarity is needed. It lives through holistic programs for housing, food, jobs, access to healthcare around the world from Haiti to Navajo, Kazakhstan to Rwanda. Paul's moral philosophy is a philosophy for the 21st century. It is one, if we follow it, that can allow us to achieve health equity through deep scholarship, understanding, and action. May we all fight for a better and more just world in this vision. Good afternoon. My name is Mercedes Becerra. I am a professor at Harvard Medical School and a senior epidemiologist with Partners in Health. My thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to celebrate our brother Paul. I will add my, my reflection of one key contribution of Paul's that blew open multiple lines of inquiry for his students, including me, to pursue, and we did. Today, I'll take you back, oh, 27 years, to 1995, to the sandscape of hills and shanty towns of northern Lima in Peru. It was early days as our small alliance of Americans and Peruvians, led by Dr. Jim Young Kim, was figuring out how we might best bring the spirit of Zami La Sante in Haiti to Peru. And it soon became clear that we would be fighting tuberculosis, as was the team in Haiti that was already a decade deep in that fight. In Lima, it was Dr. Jaime Bayona who visited local health centers and gathered anecdotal reports that many patients had recently died while receiving treatment for tuberculosis, or TB. This did not make sense because curative TB treatment had been discovered almost 50 years earlier, and Peru's TB program was recognized as one of the best. Yet many patients we interviewed recounted how they had already lost family members to this disease. So what was happening? Here's the crux. For TB medicines, TB antibiotics to work to cure you, the TB bacteria in your body need to be susceptible or killable by those particular drugs. If TB bacteria are not susceptible to being killed by a drug, they are said to be resistant to that drug. And in Lima, in interview after interview, we heard a recurring story. Persons who were sick with drug-resistant forms of TB were being given treatments that could not cure their form of TB. These treatments, called short-course regimens, were effective against TB bacteria that were susceptible to the drugs in those regimens. But the same drug regimens or combinations could not kill the TB bacteria that had already developed resistance to those drugs. A different set of drugs was needed and could cure people infected with resistant TB but at that moment, these other drugs were not available in the country. And there was an additional pernicious outcome to receiving the incorrect treatment for TB. An incorrect treatment often made the TB bacteria resistant to more drugs, so they became even harder to treat. Because TB is an airborne disease, these highly drug-resistant strains were slowly spreading in families and communities. And those new cases were also being given the incorrect treatments, and so on. In the patient stories that we heard, Paul saw a pattern emerge, the sequence of incorrect treatments with deadly outcomes that multiplied harm. And he soon began to call it the amplifier effect of short course regimens. At first, I did not understand why Paul wanted us to use this term that he just coined, the amplifier effect of short course regimens. In the literature, there were already other terms that could be used for what we were observing. For example, the term acquired resistance was common and seemed straightforward enough, as in a patient picked up more resistance while receiving the incorrect treatment, so acquired resistance. But Paul argued that these other terms were inadequate and even injurious. They led all too easily to blaming the patient. If you don't take your medicines correctly, you are the one causing your treatment failure and worsening resistance. Jim shared the same type of story from people in prison in Russia. This was evident in the stories we heard. 
In Lima, patients were being admonished to stick to incorrect treatments that had already failed their family members. Essentially, in Peru and many countries outside North America and Europe, public sector TB programs were delivering the wrong treatments to a small proportion of TB patients because the correct treatments would cost more and would not fit into the TB program's minimalist budget. Remember, this was the era of structural adjustment when many governments were cutting public sector spending in order to pay back old and unfair loans under the pressure of international finance agencies. And public health guidelines followed lockstep with the logic of cost reduction. Cutting costs was seen as the rational path, regardless of what would happen to some small proportion of TB patients that turned out to be millions around the world. The logic was that those unfortunate people already sick with resistant TB would die off. And until then, most did, but not before spreading more resistant TB. Indeed, Paul's use of the amplifier effect of short course regimens pushed the explanatory process away from blaming the individual patient. Paul's term gave clarity that what we were observing in the story of each patient was merely the sharp end of the spear. These regimens had been designed and elevated to policy in circles far from the shantytown. By naming the regimen itself as an amplifier, this could bring the whole spear into relief. This was a way of seeing that helped us simultaneously zoom out to link the harm at the sharp end to the mechanisms along the whole spear. The routinized use of the wrong medicines, the short course regimens, were creating more deadly strains of TB bacteria. And while these bacteria appeared to be the proximal cause of organ damage, illness, and untimely deaths, the harm was the product of forces more distal. To understand and explain what was happening at that sharp proximal end of the spear, we had to follow the links to the geographically and temporally distal decisions and policies and institutions that could be traced as the sources of this harm. Paul then wrote reams about our team's experience, including the amplifier effect. And this lens brought clarity in those early days to our small team of young scholars and clinicians, unequipped as we were to process our own grief and outrage. Paul gave us a method to witness to see what was there in the stories the patients told us. And now we could document how a routinized harm was being produced and reproduced. In Lima in 1995, night after night, when there was electricity, we pored over the clinical narratives, the medical records, and the lab test results. And then we aggregated these stories of patients and families. This way, we were able to delineate, in all its gory detail, the harm being produced at the sharp end while keeping in view the political and economic mechanisms that could also be seen with Paul's capacious lens of the amplifier effect. This lens was a foundational contribution that seeded multiple research programs that are still going strong. Thank you, Polo, for this singular lens, for your way of seeing. It will continue to inspire the movement that is fighting for access to the best possible treatment for every child and every adult infected with tuberculosis. Thank you. Thank you all for being with me here today. Um, so we can collectively pause to honor Paul Farmer's life, work, and his enduring impact on all of us. My name is Kim Sue, and I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Yale, where I'm an internist, an addiction medicine doctor, an anthropologist, and a researcher. I was until recently the medical director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a nonprofit dedicated to improving the health, dignity, and well-being of people who use drugs. I've taken care of patients at Rikers Island Jail System in New York City, as well as worked at methadone clinics and needle exchange programs, providing low threshold treatment for people with substance use disorders. Like so many of you, I consider myself part of Paul's vast tree of influence, and his writing and work directly inspired me to come to Harvard to pursue social medicine and anthropology in 2007. I, like so many thousands of us, would not be doing what I am doing without Paul's inspiration and the foundational work of our mentors and friends at the Harvard Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. But I am one of several students of Paul's that took his vision of equity and justice 
directly to sites of concentrated violence and injustice, but within the United States itself. In particular, using his approaches to think about and critically examine the US jail and prison system. While Paul had worked on TB and HIV and Siberian prisons and beyond, I wanted to think through the structural violence and institutional racism of the existing carceral system in the US and the long-standing failures of the so-called war on drugs. I think of these structures as enduring icons of American slavery, racial and class injustice and oppression, and systems that perpetuate harm, health inequities, social suffering, and premature death here at home. There is nothing unique or exceptional about applying Paul's work to the US prison system and caring for people who inject drugs, although we are in the midst of the worst overdose death epidemic we have ever faced in this country, with over 108,000 people dead of overdose in the past 12 months, a massive cause of premature and preventable death. However, Paul and I had often discussed the difficulties of doing field work in your own backyard, your own town, in the richest nation in the world, which is still riven with violent inequality. My patients often die young in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, a searing comment on whose lives matter. I've always thought of Paul when I've stepped into the gray zone, facing what I believe is right and what we are told is proper. I've channeled his bravado and energy and the recognition of our immense social privilege when I've carted thousands of doses of naloxone, the opioid overdose antidote, onto planes to redistribute and reallocate a dwindling national supply to get it into the hands of people actively using drugs and their family and friends saving their lives. When I know I am facing bureaucratic indifference, but what I am doing is morally right, I invoke Paul. What would Paul do, I think? When I am sitting on a panel advocating at the White House for funding for syringe service programs and decriminalization of possession of drugs, I am channeling a piece of Paul. In my book, Getting Repped, Women, Incarceration, and the American Opioid Crisis, where I use ethnography to follow women who use drugs in and out of the Massachusetts jail and prison systems, I write about Lydia, who barely made it to see me in Harvard's post-incarceration transition clinic after getting out of jail and who was using heroin chaotically. She was over an hour late to her appointment with us and barely got seen. I advocated for the clinic to remain open to wait for her, to acknowledge the gargantuan effort amidst the chaos it took to make it to us. Paul once wrote for us to think about who gets to be your patient, who makes it to you, who is so lucky. He urged us to innovate, to think about those who don't get there, those who don't get to be your patient. So many of my patients who use drugs say they would rather die than face the violence, stigma, and criminalization they experience in hospitals at the hands of our colleagues. I am constantly admonishing these colleagues who are steeped in our culture's hostility towards people who use drugs, but at the same time, in the spirit of Paul, I attempt to demonstrate and model new ways of caring through harm reduction practices and principles, meeting people where they are and not leaving them there. And still, our patients are dying, and we are not reaching enough people. Lydia told me that the reason it took her so long sometimes to reach me was she traveled in back alleys to avoid encountering police because she had open warrants. The carceral threat of criminalization, surveillance, and social control, the everyday structural violence of being a person who injects drugs in the United States, it often prevented her from accessing life-saving care. When Lydia died of an overdose several months later, I recognized it as a social, clinical, and policy failure it was, in part because of Paul's work. It marks my heart and is one of the reasons why I continue to advocate so strongly for overdose prevention centers, among other basic necessities for people who use drugs, addressing the upstream conditions of harm so that the most vulnerable people can access dignity, respect, compassion, and live to be and remain our patients. I am chastened with how easy he and Partners in Health made it look to have a preferential option for the poor, but still, despite all their hard work, how hard it is to ensure material conditions for flourishing, how to get the, quote, staff, stuff, space, and systems needed to slow or stop epidemics, even and especially here in the US. I just got my bivalent COVID booster yesterday, and still one billion people around the world remain unvaccinated. 
And according to the WHO, we have seen 6,518,749,000 COVID deaths worldwide. Paul's prescription for us was in his words to have, quote, a modicum of investment, a larger dose of social justice, and attention to the needs of those already sick or injured. We are urged on to do this work, achieving equity and justice with Paul's roadmap in our hearts and his spirit of critical inquiry in our writing and work. My work towards US prison abolition, research and advocacy in liberatory solidarity, and justice for people who use drugs relies heavily on Paul's guiding principles. With his profound optimism and his moral compass, we can continue forging this path together, a path of social justice, flourishing, and equity for all. Thank you. Mary Jo and I will share the introduction and then pass it along to Adia, who will be doing the first talk, and to Anne and David. A few words about ethnography to introduce this session. Ethnography is a mode of being acutely and attentively present, personally present, in a distinctive setting with living individuals, communities. Amanda Gorman recently said that a poem begins with a wound. For Paul, ethnography meant identifying a site of wounding and going there, making himself present and vulnerable, or finding himself in a setting and recognizing it as an uncanny site of wounding often a site of haunting. Ethnography is a mode of inquiry. It is a way of being present with urgent and difficult questions, a disciplined mode of analysis and writing. For Paul, that meant attention to history and political economy, to histories of inequality of power and resources, histories bearing on the present. Ethnography is also a form of engagement, a way of being present with individuals and communities one cannot walk away from, with a setting that demands something be done, be done not just for, but with. Paul did not walk away. He often took up that something to be done, not with optimism, except in that Gramscian sense that Jim talked about, Optimism is often based on evidence and a calculus that things will be better. But for Paul, with a profound sense of hope, a deep commitment that went beyond any evidence that things would be better. Paul the physician was always an ethnographer. And Paul the ethnographer was always a physician. <laughs> 
For Mary Jo and me, Paul was always our student, and yes, we also thought he was our retirement policy. And he honored us as his teachers. He was always our colleague and made us fellow travelers um, in what we were doing. Paul was our friend in the deepest sense, and Paul was always our teacher. Paul, the physician, activist, ethnographer, was always a teacher in particular for young physicians around the world, with whom he had a special way of being present. An acute ethnographer of local worlds of medicine, critical, of course, he engaged young doctors in creating new ways of providing health care for the poor. In an interview I did with Paul and Dr. Christophe Millian, one of Haiti's renowned OBGYN surgeons, in May of 2020, Paul said he invested, and he, this is a quote, in the young talent, new medical graduates waiting to serve, by caring for hundreds of patients, patients in partnership with them, especially during intense periods of social unrest, murders, kidnappings, coup, political violence, and ultimately earthquake disasters. He inspired and became a role for many, teaching by doing, connecting with patients. Paul's goal and efforts to quote him was to save these young doctors from cynicism, a loss of enthusiasm, a belief in the profession. It led many to return over the years to continue the partnership forged when they were young, joining in building and staffing the University Hospital at Mirabale, where Paul said, where the action was, where the promise was. Clinical teaching was, Paul's, was one of Paul's greatest joys. Dr. Millian, recently reflecting on 22 years of Paul being his professor, said, Paul oriented my analysis, my thinking, my writing, my empathy, compassion, relationships, and communications with pa patients the way I teach social medicine, my critical thinking, and scientific curiosity. He makes me think that nothing is impossible to save my patient's life. Yet he helped me to cultivate humility. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, hi, my name is Adia Benton. I am an associate professor of anthropology and African studies at Northwestern University. And I'm gonna give you a title so that you'll know the theme. Um, this paper is called uh, Reading, Reading with Paul. Um, and, and it'll be clear why, I think. But earlier this year, in the midst of a geeky text conversation with Paul about Evans Pritchard, and the Azande people of South Sudan, I wrote, I think I have ADHD. All the tools that I used to manage my disordered executive function were no longer working as I struggled to finish a book about Ebola in Sierra Leone. The Azande story I was telling him was one in a string of many diversions. And he quickly responded to me, I know I have ADHD, but I can read gangbusters. Paul is a prolific writer, as anyone who's waded through the drafts of his 100-page chapters knows. But he was also an avid reader. If there's such thing as a prolific reader, he would have been counted among them because his readings have been productive in the sense that his reading practice played a central role in his ethnographic analysis of biosocial phenomena. The practice of reading and rereading formed the foundation of his robust anthropological scholarship, which incorporated history, political economy, and clinical medicine, as you've heard from many people today. And he turned that into ethnographic analyses and political action. Paul used to say, I'm an anthropologist anytime I am awake. 
His orientation toward the world, his clinical practice, his vision of public health came from intensive study of social theory, human experience, and, and particularly illness experience and experiences of suffering, of liberation theology, of course, as many of you have heard. Um, and he also said, you know, I was, I was poor. <laughs> the handful of times I saw him on the eve of accepting some prestigious award, he'd say, not bad for a cracker from Florida, huh? And while it might be appealing to narrow his legacy to a desire to cure the world, as in the title of, subtitle of the Kidder biography, Paul's moral and intellectual legacy and praxis extend well beyond that. I first met him in 1997 when I was an undergraduate at Brown. He'd been invited to speak in a class that I would later teach at the same university 15 years later, AIDS in the International Perspective. He was friends with the course instructors, Pat Simons and Lucille Newman, two women born in the 30s who were also pioneers in medical anthropology and reproductive justice issues. We studied and discussed hundreds of pages of reading per week. Um, we hosted AIDS activists, researchers, and embarked upon projects in the AIDS community service organizations throughout Rhode Island. And, and so in preparation for Paul's visits, our professor professors assigned his work. Paul was in his late 30s, but he had already written and published two books and co-edited a third by the time we hosted him in our classroom. Um, we had to read two of those, of those three books for seminar that week. The first book was AIDS and Accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame, where he championed a geographically broad and historically deep approach uh, for interpreting what he called the ethnographically visible dimensions of social and economic life. The second was Women, Poverty, and AIDS, Sex, Drugs, and Sexual Violence, very provocative title, which was co-edited with Janie Simmons and Margaret Connors for the Institute for Health and Social Justice. So um, this is when I explain how bad a student I was. I prioritized studying for my immunology and genetics exam that week, so I did not read those books. During his lecture, Paul discussed women, poverty, and AIDS, which would serve as a manual of sorts as I carried out community work in AIDS service organizations over the coming years. Paul's impetus for writing it was inattention to patriarchy and gender, capitalism and class, racialization, racism in the social science, public health, and clinical literature on AIDS. Paul and his colleagues following the black feminist sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, and yes, he does actually cite her, foregrounded an intersectional analysis, which meant examining sexism, racism, and classism together as risk for HIV AIDS, risk factors for HIV. And in so doing, they found victim blaming and the inflation of personal choice or cultural difference, what he called immodest claims of, of causality elsewhere, lying at the root of many research, clinical, and social service programs for HIV prevention and care. Now, a fundamental aim of that book was not only to redress this by writing about and from the perspective, perspectives of poor women affected by the disease, but also to reread and rethink the scholarly literature with care for poor women at the center. And in part, this also meant incorporating poor women's perspectives and their own astute political analyses of the conditions in their communities. A chapter in Women, Poverty, and AIDS, which I think also appears in Infections and Inequalities, features a story of a group of self-described poor women, Haitian women, who in light of high rates of HIV transmission developed an education program during which they showed a video, demonstrated proper condom use, and facilitated community discussions. When they presented their work at a conference in Haiti, a doctor in the audience asked, so what? If we're failing to prevent HIV transmission, what is the significance of your project? And a woman from the group responded, Doctor, when all around you liars are the only cocks crowing, telling the truth is a victory. Telling the truth about the transmission dynamics among poor women not only entailed explicitly intersectional analyses, for Paul and his colleagues, it also meant education for preventing AIDS that would be insufficient if it did not also address sexism and sexuality, if it did not if it did not protect rather than punish sex work and sex workers, if it did not explicitly address poverty, gender inequality, and racism, and if it did not improve clinical care for women. So I wanted to pause here and ask each of you, what truths about our current COVID-19 pandemic, its causes, its prevention, and the mitigation of its effects 
are our colleagues, many of whom were trained here and worked alongside Paul. What truths are they evading as members of our, as our, members of our communities fall ill, experience its chronic effects, and die prematurely? We have the tools we have been told. As hundreds continue to die every day in this country, you do you, they say. Those of us who mourn Paul, to whom are we accountable when we individualize social problems and desocialize political problems and thus their solutions? As Paul spoke to that class that morning in 1997, I found myself flipping through the its two assigned texts, anxiously seeking out the passages, passages that he referenced. You probably know this strategy when you don't do the reading. Um, <laughs> I approached him after class and he said to me, what do you want? As if he knew that I had not done the reading. And I said, I want to know more about MDRTB, <laughs> which, you know, who does that? Uh, <laughs> and I said, the social, the social part that you talked about, and the social part to which I referred was obviously the touchstone for his life's work, understanding the social conditions that structure risk for disease and premature death, you know, social epidemiology embedding in personal, interpersonal encounters in the larger social fields in which such encounters take place and take on their meaning, that's cultural anthropology, and examining the political and economic systems emerging over time and across territories, political economy. His assistant scribbled down my mailing address, and within a few days I received a stack of photocopied journal articles in my campus mailbox. I began writing in earnest about the treatment of TB patients in New York City and later took up the topic for a global health course I took in, the first, in my first year of public health school. Researching and writing those papers set me on course for thinking differently about epidemics and what a critical social science, what Paul referred to as the resocializing disciplines, might help me to do as a public health worker and as a scholar. For my later research in writing about AIDS care, support and treatment in Sierra Leone, as well as my research on the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, this has meant unraveling the historic and enduring role of the humanitarian and development industries in shaping health landscapes. This has meant documenting the experiences of people tr tr having trouble accessing care and treatment, and it has meant understanding the racialized character of epidemic response from the colonial era forward that prioritizes containment of disease over the provision of care, that the protection of local and global elites over the provision of care, and the circulation of capital and the accumulation of wealth over the provision of care. A couple of years after our first meeting, Paul and I met again, this time at an APHA meeting in Boston. In a dynamic that would persist well into our friendship, Paul held my arm as I walked with him to a car that would be taking him to an airport. Within days of returning home to Atlanta, I emailed him still pondering my future work, and of course, he recommended more reading. This time he told me it helped him to have social theories that provide a moral and ethical anchoring for his work. Of course, you've heard this. Liberation theology is where he had found that anchor, and he recommended two texts, Boff and Boff's Introduction to Liberation Theology and Gustavo Gutierrez's A Theology of Liberation. During a conversation with Roberto Guezet Zueta uh, at Boston College's uh, School of Theology back in 2013, Paul explained the intellectual and spiritual debt to liberation theology's preferential option for the poor, and he said, that liberation theologians have some very powerful ideas that could help us understand epidemics, whether you're talking about Boston or elsewhere. I've never been to a place where the idea of a preferential option for the poor was not illuminating or useful. Again, it was a central idea not only for his clinical practice and advocacy, but also in his role as an ethnographer. As he wrote in the book he co-authored with Gutierrez, a copy of which he left in my office with an inscription and a note, an understanding of poverty must be linked to efforts to end it. Father Gustavo has often, Gustavo has often noted in his writing and in his speaking that poverty means death. The study of poverty without an expressed concern with ending it is seen with the hermeneutic of suspicion by most of the people with whom I've lived and worked. A preferential option for the poor informs our clinical work and also our efforts to move beyond individual patients to remedy inadequacies, inefficiencies, and gaps in health systems. 
The other important concepts from liberation theology guiding the work were an embodied practice of accompaniment, of pragmatic solidarity against structural violence, a phrasing he borrowed from peace studies scholar Johann Galtung to describe the large scale and, e uh, and social and economic structures in which affliction is embedded. In his attempts to further structure, uh, theorize structural violence, Paul argued that the concept is intended to inform the study of the machinery of oppression. Oppression is a result of many conditions, not the least of which reside in consciousness. And of course, he faced some pushback amongst his anthropologist interlocutors, seeking more precise conceptual language for the various forms of violence experienced by the poor. And you can read that in, I think, current anthropology, uh, anthropology of structural violence. And in some ways, this criticism misses the point a point that Paul made by writing copious, sometimes snarky footnotes, index, interest, in, index entries, and very long, meticulously documented books. No single social theory or methodology, no devotion to analytic parsimony that a single theory might offer us is adequate for explaining and ultimately defeating the sinful structures in which we are all enmeshed and often help to reproduce. Nevertheless, Structural violence must be named. Again, I want to address the national response to the current pandemic in which we find ourselves using Paul's words, also with a nod to the Azande cosmology with which I began. We will therefore need to examine as well the roles played by the erasure of historical memory and other forms of desocialization as enabling conditions of structures that are both sinful and ostensibly nobody's fault. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Becker. I'm a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. And um, I want to start by saying it's a great honor to join my esteemed colleagues in paying tribute to the moral and intellectual legacy of Paul's, <clears throat> excuse me, of Paul Farmer, and in particular to offer a brief additional comment in response to Professor Benton's erudite and moving remarks. Knowledge production was at the heart of Paul's project to repair the world, and ethnography was his preferred mode of producing knowledge. Indeed, much of his transformative analytic work, from his first book to his last, is built on the sturdy empirical foundation of rigorous ethnographic scholarship. For Paul, ethnographic data were also deployed as a corrective, a rebuttal to dominant explanatory narratives in global health, public health. Ethnography, a methodologic lever to be pulled to critique or rescue overly reductive analyses that featured, in the words of one of his signature phrases, immodest claims of causality. With experience near data and richly contextualized formulation, he's, he sought to enlarge the scope of inquiry and understanding, and especially relentlessly he meant to upend the narrow view of resource scarcity as a fixed and terminal condition, as if it were a given that could not be undone by the same social structural forces that birthed it. It needs to be said that Paul was equally ready to critique reductive analyses issuing from ethnographic work, debunking unsupported culturalist formulations that were not just inaccurate, but also dangerous in obscuring actionable social structural determinants of poor health. He pointed out rightly that culture was overworked as an explanatory variable and cautioned against sweeping it into a narrative of convenience or contrivance. Deeply interested in people, their lives, and lived experience, Paul's brilliance as an ethnographer his unparalleled skill and discernment of the dynamics of poor health and the inroads he could make with therapeutic, social, and scholarly intervention stemmed from his capacity to listen 
and his abiding commitment to presence and accompaniment. The scope of Paul's analysis was more panoramic and complex than ethnography alone could encompass. And Paul, a cosmopolitan and intrepid scholar, brought the tools of historical analysis, lots of other tools too, from <laughs> liberation theology, political economy, epidemiology, etc. He brought these to bear toward limiting the social structural pathogens that entrench poverty, poor health, and other forms of suffering. And to be clear, knowledge production was never the end game that Paul had in mind for his work. Rather, his goal was to produce knowledge that could be trained toward translational purpose, toward a path for redress. Like Professor Benton, I think often of the impression Paul made on me when we first met in the fall of 1983, when Paul was an applicant to HMS, who, like me and Jim Kim too, hoped to study anthropology in a joint MD-PhD program that was just being rolled out. And I was a first-year student dispensing my wisdom to Paul. <laughs> that was not an era for the field of anthropology, when scholars or students were generally encouraged to fashion their scholarship for translational use. I told Paul so. And when he averred that he certainly would not be attending any doctoral program that frowned on applied work, I remember how worried I was for his future in the field. <laughs> Paul did matriculate the following year, which made us something like academic siblings. And to press the analogy, I worried not just about Paul and his future, but also that he was going to get us into trouble with our academic parents. But the story ended differently, and quite well, as you already know. Thank goodness for that, and for many of us who were inspired by his example to reimagine and sharpen our work for translational impact. Paul's moral authority rested in no small measure on his rigorous scholarship, which laid the unshakable foundations of his analyses. This scholarship, in turn, laid groundwork that transformed the field of global health and certainly transformed his grateful colleagues. Alongside his commitment to illuminate the social roots of sickness and attendant misery, ran Paul's commitment to pragmatic action in the present and to social change and redress of the unconscionable burden of suffering in the future. Paul never lost sight of this purpose. From one book to the next, a conversation he started with us in AIDS and Accusation and continued through fevers, feuds, and diamonds, stretched across continents, centuries, and pandemics, and carried health equity as its through line and purpose. To close, I underscore the transformative legacy of Paul's ethnographic work. Not just in what it is, which is gripping and rendering the context of lived experience, incisive in its analyses, and persuasive in its plain spoken eloquence. Not just in what it does, in re-socializing our understanding of pathogenic forces, and then teaching, cajoling, exhorting, and infusing us with righteous optimism that a path to health equity can be found, but also, importantly, in how it calls, how it calls to this generation, to future generations, to all of us gathered to honor him today, to finish this work. And we will, with all my gratitude for his legacy. My name is David Jones, and I was one of Paul's many students who became a colleague with him in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. We are all remembering and celebrating Paul today for many reasons. One reason that has not yet been discussed is his prowess as a historian. Some of you will be surprised to hear me say this. We all know that Paul was famous as a physician, anthropologist, visionary, and humanitarian. But as a historian? <laughs> 
Let me make the case. In 2015, in October, I flew with Paul to Dubai for the grand opening of the Center for Global Health Delivery. While waiting between flights in an airport lounge, he reached into his tote bag and pulled out a file. You have to see this, he said. He had found the ship's log from the Mantua, a British cruiser during World War I that had sailed from Plymouth, England to Freetown in Sierra Leone in August 1918. It was likely this ship that introduced influenza to Sierra Leone, sparking an epidemic that quickly spread throughout West Africa. Paul was delighted that you could find archival evidence like this to support his arguments about the toxic connections between imperialism, political economy, inequality, and infectious disease. By 2015, I was no longer surprised to encounter Paul's love of history. Even though he had come to Harvard to study medicine and anthropology, his curiosity was immense. In his first year at Harvard Medical School, he was introduced to history of medicine by Alan Brandt. Their encounter had a lasting impact on Paul's thinking. You can see this in his earliest work. AIDS and accusation is full of history. Paul narrated the emergence of AIDS in Haiti, a history he himself had witnessed. He showed how the local community in Conge had been displaced and impoverished when a hydroelectric dam project had flooded their valley in 1956. He argued repeatedly that you could not function in Haiti either as an ethnographer or as a physician if you did not understand Haitian history, from its conquest to its plantations, slavery, revolution, reparations, American military interventions, and survival. When Paul began to work in Rwanda in 2005, he knew that he had to study the long history of colonization and genocide there. When he began to work in Liberia and Sierra Leone in 2014, he took a deep dive into their histories as well. It was this curiosity that had led him to the captain's log from 1918. And his historical analyses are on dramatic display in his last book, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds. The four historical chapters are the longest section of that book. He convincingly shows how the long history of colonization, extractive capitalism, war, and medical neglect had left the local communities susceptible to Ebola. As he was writing this book, he often sent me draft chapters, 100-page draft chapters, uh, to make sure that he had gotten this history right. I offered whatever advice that I could, but he knew far more about West African history than I did. Paul's scholarship, in turn, had a profound impact on my own work and on all of my colleagues. My dissertation examined the epidemics that assailed indigenous communities during the European conquest of the Americas. I always thought of my work as an attempt to take Paul's anthropological insights about structural violence, social suffering, and infectious disease and apply them to a historical case study. Many scholars have argued that American Indians had been genetically destined to die in great numbers from the diseases that Europeans introduced into the Americas. I pushed back against this, inspired by Paul. Indigenous Americans had not been born vulnerable to epidemics. Instead, they had been made vulnerable by the devastation, chaos, and suffering of European colonization. My own writings prompted many conversations with Paul about our shared historical interests. He often wanted updates from me about the latest historical or archaeological research about the demographic of Hispaniola in the 1490s and 1500s. We repeatedly discussed the competing claims that have been made by researchers about whether Haiti or the United States had first exposed the other to HIV. We debated whether the high rates of hypertension that Paul had found in Haiti could be attributed to the people's histories of slavery and forced labor. As you've heard many times today, Paul always had a knock for capturing complex ideas with clever slogans. He would often talk about immodest claims of causality or the space, staff, stuff, and systems that are required for good medical care. To explain his ideas about biosocial analysis, he told people to look around and to look behind. As Byron had said, to examine both the politi 
the political economy of a community and its history. Historical analysis was always an essential part of his thinking, not only because he had deep curiosity about the people with whom he worked, but also because he knew that historical insight could inform and motivate the interventions that communities need. History, like anthropology, could be applied productively to healthcare delivery. And I will always be grateful for, to Paul for demonstrating this so well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, I am the only person um, in this whole group of people who uh, uh, didn't know Mr. Farmer, Dr. Farmer, at, at all, except the way you know someone important and uh, um, wonderful. So I can't say Paul uh, did this and Paul and I did that. But um, I, I am th thinking that uh, 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 in some ways I, I am the ideal person um, to say something uh, about him uh, um, uh, because so much of uh, uh, the love he had for the world and the wanting to heal the world would have been directed uh, uh, at someone like me. Um, uh, uh, I, I come from a place uh, in the world where when I was a child, a person like Dr. Farmer would have been an especially welcome presence in my life. Uh, I'm often described by people as uh, growing up in, in tropical poverty, and the example they will give is uh, that I had no, I grew up without uh, running water in my house, central plumbing or um, electricity, and uh, sometimes if I feel like annoying them, I will say, well, neither did Queen Victoria. Um, but then sometimes I'm just quiet. I don't say anything. I let them say that. Um, but I, I, I did grow up in, in, in poverty, though um, what that would mean um, perhaps this is an example uh, of the poverty I uh, grew up with. I had measles, whooping cough, and typhoid fever all before I turned seven, um, one after the other, and I survived them. I saw children uh, my age um, 
die. I was in hospital and they, they died. And I could tell they died because a screen was drawn around their crib. Uh, no screen was drawn around uh, my crib. Um, but then I had a small scratch on my shin uh, that wouldn't heal, and it eventually became uh, the saw, a saw the size of a penny, a British size penny. It then began to behave like a little volcano, growing in depth, changing colors, red, pink, yellow, uh, erupting, subsiding, uh, and no, no one knew what to do about it. There was no doctor that I could be taken uh, to see about uh, this uh, changing thing on my shin um, that sometimes was so deep you could almost see the bone. Um, uh, my poor mother uh, uh, was torn between blaming herself from not... Uh, protecting me from evil spirits that had been set upon us by someone who envied me, uh, in, in particular for my stellar performance in school, or, or someone who envied her because she was the only woman my stepfather had married. That is the only woman with whom he had children and had married. He had many children with many women, and um, for some reason he married her. Um, on the other hand, she believed and could see the imperial penny-sized wound uh, I had on my shin might bear being attended to by a doctor. And so every other afternoon, I went to a clinic where the wound was looked at by a nurse uh, who would swab it with cotton soaked in iodine, then gentian violet, and bandage it up and send me home. And this went on uh, uh, three times a week I saw her, Monday afternoons after school, Wednesday afternoons after school, Friday afternoons after school. Nothing happened to the wound. It went this way, that way. Uh, and then, um, uh, one day it glistened, it grew a scab, again like a volcano, it glistened and the glistening uh, grew less and less and uh, then it was healed, the scab fell away and then I had uh, just a pink flesh that then turned to the usual color uh, of my brown skin. Um, uh, this sore was, that was so worrying, once it healed, it was forgotten by everyone except me uh, because I can still see uh, the scar every day. Uh, as I say, I did not know of a doctor farmer or that there could be such a thing as a doctor farmer, a person who uh, would... Uh, not just go out of his way, but go out of, of his own self to think of someone like me or the many people who look like me. Um, as I say, I know of him because I read, I read about him in, in, in newspapers. I took a special interest in him whenever I saw something about him because I, again, I was reminded of my childhood and uh, all the people I grew up with um, who would um, die of things that, you know, something people would die of easily is something called a goiter. It was well known you shouldn't have a goiter operation because you would never come out of it. Um, but I can see that if there was a Dr. Farmer in our lives, we would have come out of it. Um, his interest, I want to say, of healing, um, his love for people who were wounded, um, uh, or who suffered wounds that they had not caused themselves, uh, 
and did not know how to speak of the people who, who caused them, um, touched me uh, in, again, the way I came to know him in this, in this public way. And uh, I sincerely regret not being able to, to thank him. Um, not that it would have mattered. Um, so here we are celebrating the life of this good man. We're sad, but also we have a kind of joy because he added so much to, our, to lives, my own, even though, as I say, I, 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 I didn't know him. Um, but speaking personally, uh, well, I am always speaking personally, so... Um, I, I am um, filled with a little bitterness at life uh, in general, um, and I hope you'll allow, forgive me if I'm, uh, but when I, I, I don't remember exactly where I was, but I heard of him dying, and I it was, of course, sad, immediately sad, and, and then also uh, uh, very angry, um, because it was another reminder of the unfairness of, of uh, the thing called death, that it, it, it seems um, as if it, it ought to, death ought to have some feeling of you know, the weight of things. Well, should it be Dr. Farmer or should it be Henry Kissinger? Uh, that you and I know who we would choose if it came to that. Um, or, you know, the man, uh, a person like Dick Cheney who could live without a heart. Um, for a very long time until someone gave him a heart and he has a heart and then there's Dr. Farmer. These are the things that cross my mind as I uh, was thinking of, of that sad um, day. Um, and then of course last week or maybe it was two weeks ago when a, a, a woman who um, was the face of the most successful criminal organization in the world, the British Empire, lived to be 96. Uh, that seemed incredibly unfair. Um, I told you these events, uh, th this event brought up uh, bitterness uh, and the unfairness um, but then uh, I end with gratitude for however short a time uh, Dr. Farmer was with us. Um, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a singular honor to be here with you all to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Paul Farmer, to keep on keeping on, as Brian Stevenson mentioned this morning. I am João Biel, and I'm a professor of anthropology at Princeton University, where I also direct the Brazil Lab. Will they show the image? Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. The trick of the world, its secret and its truth, is that it is the fountain of all things. The analytical task before us is to contain at least the most important part of that messy complexity and contingency. The pain and the pleasures, the sorrows and joys, the desires and remembrances, and sometimes the catastrophe. These are some of the last words Paul Farmer inscribed for us 
in the foreword for the book Arc of Interference, Medical Anthropology for Worlds on Edge, honoring the work of our mentor, Arthur Kleinman. Words that guide my thoughts here. In the wake of the catastrophe of his untimely death, Paul's own arc of interference, always keenly aware of power and privilege, and with an uncompromising bent towards care and justice, accompanies us, probes us, keep us on edge. The challenge of translating into words the world's seemingly effortless trick, he writes, which means fixing the flux into local and time-bounded descriptions and understanding shields some and exposes others. Many would speak of raging torrents rather than of refreshing wellsprings. Whether faced with fountain or flood, the way we know the world is through lived experience, the humanist continues. What could be more mundane, more worldly, than the fate of each one of us when faced with the fact of our own mortality? Paul certainly thought a lot about what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meant when he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. In the face of life's onslaught and its highly unequal currents of illness, injury, and finitude, Paul's moral philosophy is deeply ethnographic, relentlessly relational and defiantly open. It always starts in the midst of variable social worlds and myriad friendships, as we have witnessed throughout today. It detonates boundaries and sustains a mysteriousness to existence then and now. Tut moon se moon, every person is a person. There's always a time when reason fails us. An unexpected or protected illness the untimely passing of a loved one, a destroyed home, the violence of being too poor and without a right to health. Trust in life is gone. Why me? Why now? Who cares? Where to? Questions that death in all its forms poses to the afflicted and that science cannot disappear. We are not machines, after all. In pain, we seek others, we pray for relief, we want language, we plot a hereafter. As Poles and Partners in Health Praxis has forcefully and creatively demonstrated time and again, the political and ethical becomes incarnate in the bodies, mobilities, and desires of each person. In his words, even at its most interior, Experience is always social, lived out within local worlds, enmeshed not only in physical bodies, but also in broader and cosmopolitan social webs than cells spun into global assemblages. As mentioned before, this historically deep and geographically broad moral philosophy knows that diseases themselves make a grim and preferential option for the poor. Against a politics of neglect, it does responds to what needs attention, investment, and work, implicating us all in our various roles, challenging our capacity to listen, to speak truth to power, and to build practical solidarities at our own ethical peril. Otherwise, as Angela Davis powerfully says, the refusal or inability to do something, say something, when a thing needs doing or saying is unbearable. That we were approaching worlds on the edge has served as a premise for much of the past decades of social science, in which inequality, violence, and uncertainty have enveloped lives. Exhaustion and anomie 
have been deeply felt on the edges of autocracy and predatory capitalism, of infrastructural breakdown and slow and abrupt forms of climate crisis, mediated by extreme populism, war, disinformation, and state and corporate efforts to dismantle meaningful, though piecemeal, agendas of socioeconomic rights. Today, we find ourselves past a stage of foreboding. How then do we enlanguage these times and interfere in and shift their course, attentive not only to the massive scale of vulnerability, affliction, and death that has come into view, but also to the efforts across continents of people struggling to care for one another and to make sense of suffering and alter its horizons. For as Paul has always insisted, escapes, surprising escapes, and alternative forms of conviviality emerge alongside newfangled scales of harm, and anthropology and medicine must be open to people's theodicy and seize this stubborn, careful will to create community. In the land of the living, sick or injured people seek care, and caregiving is central to the journey. Caregiving begins before death and reliably extends well beyond it. We hear you, Paul. With his moral, philosophical lantern always in hand, Paul would expose the socializing nature of abstract prescriptions and speak against the myopic idea that expertise alone will save you. It won't. And much like the luminous political economist Albert Hirschman, he too advocated for the inalienable right of every person and nation to a non-projected future. That is, the possibility of something more and something wonderful, his words. Accompaniment, which comes from the Latin ad cum panis, which is one way of saying breaking bread together is the embodiment of this vital vision that many this morning and this afternoon evoked. To accompany someone, Paul says, is to go somewhere with them, to break bread, bread together, to be present on a journey. There's an element of mystery and openness. I will share your fate for a while. Accompaniment, he adds, is much more often about sticking with a task until it's deemed complete by the person being accompanied rather than by the accompaniateur. Accompanying people in central Haiti in the fight for water, wood, food, and medicines, the young Paul took practical spiritual and intellectual solace in the liberation theology of Father Gustavo Gutierrez to be with the poor on a journey away from scarcity, suffering, and premature and stupid death. There's also a deep material underpinning to the idea of accompaniment, as people's sense of home spread beyond the immediate domicile. The laku, a subaltern form of land management and housing, common in rural Haiti, and that resisted the return of the plantation, must have informed Paul's thinking here. In a laku, a set of houses are linked by a yard with a ritual space where multi-generational families work cooperatively and provide for each other and care for their dead. Accompaniateurs, the communal structures, and the multi-generational values of Laku that survived one displacement after the next are partners in health. In its elasticity and bold scaling up, this practice vision of presence with others and unconditional caregiving has profoundly challenged the inequities of hegemonic aid models, redefined the boundaries of feasibility, and has equally bent the arc of medical rationality and global healthcare delivery away from unreflected on quick fixes. Yes, disease is never just one thing. There is no one size fits all. 
straight-up technology delivery does not necessarily translate into patient care. Biology and technology interact in ways we cannot always predict. Health is biosocial through and through, and horizons are needed. The trick of the world, its secret and its truth, is that it is the fountain of all things. Post-liberationist moral philosophy is set against extractivist economic models and breaks the grip of stagnant institutions on our imagination. It asks us to see others as creative agents of health, not just as problems or victims, and healthcare as a critical insurgency. Forcing us to think against the grain together, attentive to the non-teleological ways that sociomedical and political forces unfold in the field, and to care for the as yet unthought that keeps knowledge making and response open to extemporization in constant recalibration. In other words, it calls for conceptual and political projects anchored on dignity and equity that continue to beckon us to intellectual work, solidarity, and practical commitments to justice, enlarging the sense of what is possible, especially when, at first, appears to be out of view. In the face of suffering, regardless of its cause, there is nonetheless relief and comfort from family, friends, and even strangers. And this happens after death as well. Paul wrote so lovingly and presciently, urging us to activate our horizoning capacity, as Adriana Petrina would say. As seas rise, glaciers melt, and forests burn, who among us isn't called to peer toward the horizon? And who among us, he ever so pushed, doesn't have to? These are Paul's living words. Like the direly needed seeds, the person, animal, spirit, plants, in this artwork by the Amazonian indigenous artist, Denilson Baniwa. For destruction is never absolute, and communities of desire persist in bringing healing to our riven earth. I'm Hans Saucy. I teach in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations and the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. And my talk is called Paul Before Paul. It is incomprehensible the fact that someone can become something so quickly. I'll never forget the moment when what used to be my father arrived in an urn of fake marble. That's Paul Farmer speaking in 1985, from a letter I've been keeping, like all of his letters, through countless moves and life changes. Like all of you, I can't bear to see Paul turn into a thing. And one way of forestalling that is to make his words resound again. I had the astonishing good fortune to befriend Paul in 1978 or 79, and to keep up with him ever after. We exchanged a lot of letters, for the younger ones in the audience, a letter is a document often written by hand on paper and sent through an agency called the post office. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Whether we were in pres whether in presence or by letter, we were in a constant laser tag stream of jokes, questions, gossip, reflections, and grandiose plans. The number of books we, de we decided to write is uncountable. I don't want to claim excessive privileges from this long acquaintance, which I'm certainly not alone in having, but today it allows me to let Paul speak for himself from the time before he was Paul, so to speak. We're talking today about Paul's moral and intellectual legacy. Paul as a world historical figure, as Arthur put it this morning. Yes, we must. 
I think Paul really came into his own when PIH demonstrated first that MDRTB was infectious and could be cured, even in the poorest communities, and second, that HIV could be controlled, also in the poorest and least equipped communities, if only the necessary drugs were made available. These two victories, owed to many, but many who were inspired or led by Paul, solidified his position in global health and made his so-called idealism look like practical common sense. But I want to take you back to a time when Paul was not yet Paul, so to speak, when nobody knew about him, and he had little but his own stubborn energy and commitment to go on. One of the characteristics that made him so endearing, and which many have mentioned today, was his ability to focus on the particular person in front of him, not caring at all about whether that person was important or influential, since every person is important to him or herself, and he could adopt that perspective. One example, 1983, and Paul was back home from, in Brooksville after a state stint in Haiti, recovering from malaria, as I learned later. But he found time to write me a succession of missives chronicling his erotic pursuit through the swamps of an elusive blue heron named Great Blue. A sort of comic allegory of one of our frequent topics of discussion, our ongoing late adolescent girlfriend problems. He wrote from Haiti, uh, after a brief visit to Boston, that he was relieved to be free of Jack Frost and his foliage-hating henchmen. That must have been in October. A month or so later, from Boston, I am going to Haiti in 19 days, bam nouvelles en miou, for a site visit, as they say in development set jargon, and I wish it were for 19 years. I got to travel around Haiti with him, got to know and admire the great father Fritz Lafontaine, who was Paul's strongest local supporter, and saw for myself how completely dedicated he was to the place and to all Haitians. The Zomi friends, he mentioned, were some Haitian neighbors of mine in New Haven whose lives and extended family he never failed to inquire about. Some of the pictures you've seen this morning were taken by me in 1983, starring a gangly, grinning, excited Paul in his real country and in his element. I only wish I had taken more. In 1983, Haiti was still in the grip of the Duvalier kleptocracy, and we had to be careful what we said and to whom because Baby Doc's informers and enforcers were everywhere. That changed in 1986 with the déchoucage, or eradication, of the Duvaliers. Paul wrote me, still celebrating about Haiti. Touch and go for a bit, as Père, that means Père Lafontaine, was missing for 10 days. Be caché net. He totally disappeared. Right? He resurfaced, quit the Maquis the day after the baby left. As you know, the ebullience didn't last. A junta took control and declared Paul persona non grata for several years, forcing him to remain unhappily the prisoner of Jack Frost and Harvard. Those were hard years for the clinic in Conge, years of intimidation and scarcity. Then came in 1994 the chance to go back. Paul's first act was to give the clinical staff time off. On Friday, it was my great pleasure to send the bulk of the medical staff, two doctors and two nurses, home. No problem, I said. I can cover both the general and the women's clinic. The first couple of hours was fun, straightforward. Malaria, bronchitis, one case each of typhoid and TB, diarrheal disease, some dermatoses, impetigo, etc. But then came a tibial fracture. As you know, the x-ray machine is down, so I had to set it manually and cast it, thanking all the while my ortho-tutor. Less than an hour ago, I delivered my first post tt baby. The harm done by those harsh years took time to repair. Merely repairing was never on Paul's agenda, though. I arrived to find no asthma meds, mine are gone now too, no metronazidol, no Cipro, canamycin, no sterile saline solution, no catheters, and no morphine. Ringer's lactate is the only IV solution available. The women's health clinic is poorly stocked. The health crisis is unprecedented. Conge has the only functional medical care in the entire central plateau. 
Three years ago, it was one of seven comparable institutions. From another letter. There are enough new cases of AIDS in the Central Plateau and enough horror stories to warrant the building of a small hospice. This is something Fritz and I had discussed last year, and it seems more than ever a noble idea. That noble idea led eventually to the provision of advanced therapies that brought HIV patients in the Conge Clinic back to life and health and proved the naysayers wrong. You know the story from then on. We are all grateful to Paul. Even if we were not his patients, he did cure us, many of us at least, of our depressions and hopelessness, of the feelings and thoughts of futility and resignation that disarmed us before the injustices he wouldn't accept. It seems to me that he knew from the start, from his gangly, giggly start, what he needed to do. I was fortunate to have him for 43 years as my reality check, my moral compass, the person I could count on to read my messy drafts, the friend I could tell anything to. Every one of you, I know, can say something similar. Paul sometimes reminded me of his namesake, the Apostle Paul. You remember, the one who said that the wisdom of the world is folly in the eyes of God, and the folly of the inspired is the true wisdom. Surely it took more than a grain of folly or wisdom to fail to understand why people in Haitian villages should not expect the same quality of health care that the well-heeled denizens of Cambridge, Massachusetts expect. As Confucius said, I need two kinds of people, crazy ones and careful ones. Crazy ones to forge ahead, careful ones to avoid making mistakes. It's really there, Analex Book 13. Paul could be as careful as anyone, but his soul, if I may speak in such terms, was with the craziness. He loved defying passive acquiescence. Some of his more stinging phrases hang for me as brightly as warning comets in the sky. Managing inequality, socialized for scarcity, medical nihilism. And on the bright side, the hermeneutic of generosity, the preferential option for the poor, expert mercy. Paul's priorities were prisoners first, then patients, then students. You can analogize to fit your own sphere of action. I always try to do so. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vikram Patel. Uh, I was uh, recruited by Paul to join the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine just over five years ago, and I was told very recently that this was uh, over a bet that he took uh, with Arthur Kleinman. Um, and apparently the big prize of the bet was a Chinese banquet. And this goes to show that Paul's moral and intellectual legacy that we've heard about so much so far could easily coexist with an incredible sense of humor. My whole life's work has been largely devoted to addressing, understanding and addressing mental health disparities, particularly in the country that I come from, India. If the numbers of us who will one day experience one of the conditions classed under the broad rubric of mental illness are substantial, and a majority of all families are likely to be affected, then the truly staggering number is how few in need will receive much in the way of help from professionals trained to provide it. This was the opening sentence that Paul wrote in the foreword to the second edition of my book, Where There Is No Psychiatrist, a volume whose first edition I wrote more than 20 years ago to support frontline workers in low-resource settings to support the recovery journeys of those in their own communities who were struggling with mental health problems. Some years after I joined Harvard, Paul and I wrote in The Lancet in a piece that we were arguing for a moral case to understand how the world should address mental health problems. We will need to reframe the appalling fact that most people with severe mental disorders and disabilities die earlier than they should simply because they do not have access to quality and person-centered care as a moral outrage 
No less an insult to our basic humanity than the arguments that people with HIV in Africa could be left to die because their country's health systems were weak or the interventions unaffordable. I remember these, these, these sentiments very well, having lived and worked in Zimbabwe in the mid-1990s, watching patients with HIV die under my watch in the psychiatric ward simply because they did not have access to medication that was already saving lives here in the US. He wrote, to do so, global health delivery practitioners will need to adopt a rights-based approach to healthcare. This approach demands that people with a lived experience must be at the center of decision-making about which interventions should be prioritized. Interventions should cover both the clinical and social aspects of the conditions, and they must be delivered with the full participation of the person affected. This has been really the essence of my own journey, using the tools of clinical, social, and implementation science, and in more recent years, invoking digital technologies to reimagine mental health care, particularly in India, but also in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. India is the country of my birth, where I've lived most of my life. And much of my work, as Paul did with PIH in various countries, uh, was done with a non-governmental organization called Sangat. At the heart of my work was to address the critical shortage and maldistribution of mental health professionals, not by asking for more medical schools and mental health professionals to move to these communities because I knew they never would, but by leveraging the resources that communities already had in their midst. Mostly, these were individuals who lived in those communities, who spoke the same language, who shared the same social world, and who had no intention of migrating anywhere else. In doing so, I was really building upon the very rich experiences of iconic figures in India and in Africa who had transformed healthcare from the ground up. Some of this work was documented in an amazing book that was a, was, a, was a huge inspiration for me, People's Health in People's Hands. But unknown to me that at the same time as I was beginning to actually work in this particular area, Paul Farmer and his organization, Partners in Health, were doing very similar work in other parts of the world, particularly focusing, of course, as we've heard earlier today, uh, on improving access to care for people with HIV and TB. When I did discover this, I was captivated by Paul's description of the role of the community health worker as accompanying a person on their journey to recovery. And I realized that much of what we do in the mental health space completely parallels this notion of accompaniment. Today, the very large and compelling body of implementation science that demonstrates the effectiveness of how people in the community using resources in their own communities can actually support the recovery of people with mental health problems, has laid the foundation of a transformed vision of mental health care. And I think what Paul implied is that in doing so, we flip the narrative that we hear so often of communities being under-resourced. Typically, that means they're under-resourced because they do not have enough hospitals and specialists. We flip that narrative by actually stating that every community has resources, people who care for one another, and it is our job to help those communities leverage and empower those resources. But it would be a mistake to consider accompaniment, as some people do, as a stopgap arrangement, as a band-aid, to tide communities over until we have enough hospitals and specialists. Because I believe, and I have seen through my own work, that when you receive care from someone who you identify with, who speaks your language, who you know you're going to see tomorrow, who shares the same social world, who sees you in your own home, who often integrates your mental health needs with your physical health needs and your other social health care needs, it invokes a very powerful current of social connectedness, which I think is almost impossible to replicate in the ivory towers of modern medicine. Moreover, this kind of care is much less likely to engender the kind of fear and shame that inf not so infrequently accompanies consultation with mental health professionals in big hospitals. And it empowers entire communities to take control of 
and address their own health needs. The essence, of course, of that book I mentioned earlier, People's Health in People's Hands. In conclusion, Paul wrote uh, again in the foreword uh, to, to my book, it is also true that some experiences in such settings, much of my work had been really coming from South Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, but he wrote that much of what I wrote might plausibly inform the transformation of America's healthcare system. I have arrived in this country about six years ago, and I have been astonished to see so much need, unmet need, in a country that has so much. In some ways, it seems morally even more un unacceptable than compared to the unmet needs that I witness in India and Africa. Indeed, the U.S. spends more on mental health care than on virtually any other health condition and enjoys more mental health resources per capita than any other country in the world. And yet, I think anyone who lives in this country will witness that we are watching a profound decline in all our mental health indicators, virtually every single metric. It's clear that money alone will not solve the problem. Global mental health, then, is a discipline that is quintessentially global, just as relevant in our own communities, in our own backyards in this country, as it is in the distant lands that often we practice global health in. As Paul wrote in his last sentence, it is a job of all of us to fight for the dignity of the afflicted. For me, that is the essence of accompaniment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alan Brandt. I'm a historian of medicine and public health and a longtime member of the faculty of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, I'm currently the interim chair of the department, Paul Farmer Chair, for more than the last decade. I first met Paul in, in 1984 as a first year medical student. Someone had told him, Maybe you should read more about the history of medicine. And as became clear today, Paul was just the most voracious reader one could imagine. He came to see me in my office, and we started a program of reading. And within weeks, certainly within a month or two, he was so far ahead of me. And when we think about flipping the narrative, Paul went so quickly from thinking of me as his teacher to my thinking of Paul as my teacher and mentor. And though Paul was young and a medical student and doing a thousand things and spending most of his weeks in Haiti, Paul became my mentor and my teacher as he was for so many of us gathered here today in this room and many, many online. I learned so much from Paul, and like I think so many that he touched, um, he had a gigantic impact on me, both in terms of my career, but also personally. It's been a remarkable day here of remembrance and reflection about our beloved friend Paul. I want to thank all of you who have gathered here today, and I especially want to thank the speakers. I've been to many memorial events filled with sadness and reflection, but quite frankly, I've never heard a series of talks and a series of reflections that have been so deeply moving and meaningful, and I know that's true for so many of you here. I want to thank Salman Khashavji and Marty Zeev for conceiving and planning this afternoon's symposium 
which only enriched the beautiful and moving talks given this morning. Our speakers today in both programs have captured Paul's brilliance, his genius, his intense moral vision, his fierce commitment to health and healing, his intolerance for social injustice, his strategic advocacy in support of health as a human right, and the fundamental basis for global health equity. Paul was so remarkable in so many ways, and that's one of the things that I think we understand today, as so many people have pointed out, we'll never meet another Paul. But Paul, I think, today and in the future, his ideas, his commitment, his values, his brilliance will be very much with us. I realized today that Paul was so gentle and kind, but at the same time, so absolutely fiercely committed to justice and equity. And sometimes we think of those as contradictory qualities, this gentle kindness, this easy smile. But at the same time, Paul was steely in his determination to make a better world. He was a humble person, always sensitive to the needs of others. As many have explained, Paul's vision began with the interaction at the bedside with a patient in need of skill, treatment, and caring. Paul was a brilliant diagnostician in so many ways and a deeply caring physician. His analytic framework emerged from this encounter with an individual, a person in need. What accounted for their symptoms? How did they reflect the interactions of the biological and the social? How did the patient's suffering and illness reflect a deep social history of inequity, exploitation, and extraction? To heal the patient he understood would require the insights of social medicine if we were to fundamentally change the world that produces inequity and illness. Paul loved universities and he knew how to leverage Harvard's identity and resources. He was absolutely committed to the idea that research, learning and teaching must be a critical component of fundamental social change. In Paul's thinking, universities constituted an essential element in understanding and building a truly just and decent society. But his view is never uncritical. He understood that universities would never succeed as ivory towers. It was only in their engagement with the world's most difficult and important problems that they would ever have the kind of impact that they must. Students flocked, as many have observed, to these ideas and found motivation and inspiration in his teaching and in his transformative vision. Paul made us all better. He found value in our own work that we had often overlooked. This was certainly true for me. He had a way of always making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. For this reason, collaboration and deep and enduring partnerships were central to his vision. Our university and our department, typically and as it will be referred to as Paul's department, remains absolutely committed to maintaining and expanding his capacious moral and intellectual vision, a legacy of deep investigation and profound understanding, a legacy of innovation and creativity, a legacy of caring and commitment to global health equity through the preferential care of the poor, a legacy of building programs and institutions through connection and collaboration. Paul knew that only through these relationships could we instigate genuine change to repair the world. Paul drew us 
and thousands of others to his cause, he believed we could all contribute to this movement through our research, through deeply committed teaching and mentorship, through caring and service, through a commitment to enduring and dedicated accompaniment. He taught us that we must be there for one another. Today here at Harvard, and with the remarkable institutions that Paul built, Partners in Health, the University of Global Health Equity, the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, we all come here to rededicate ourselves to this mission. As difficult as it has been for so many of us to imagine the world without Paul, his teaching and his brilliant vision and example will continue to inspire us and motivate us in our efforts as it has in the past and it will in the future. This then is a time for us to honor Paul's memory by the work we do tomorrow in the days and years and decades ahead. Today's program will be just the first in a yearly series of symposia examining Paul's vision and scholarship with the goal of seeking new and innovative approaches to the highest quality care for all. We look forward to working with you to boldly advance this agenda, which must reflect the best application of what we discover and what we know and what we learn. As Paul taught us, we must produce not only biomedical innovations, but also research and understand how to deliver them to those most in need. Um, he understood and he supported the remarkable biomedical advances, but what we haven't been able to do and what we must is to figure out how to deliver them equitably and fairly and justly to populations around the world, especially those most in need. We come together today in sorrow, but with Paul's characteristic optimism and spirit to recommit ourselves to these goals, which are at the center of our work, our medical school, our university. So again, I wanna thank our wonderful speakers. They're, they're their vision and their hope and their ability to capture Paul's remarkable qualities, I have to say, has just meant so much to me today. I want to thank all of you who are here in person, those who are online. I want to thank President Bacow and his office and Dean Daly and all my friends and colleagues in the department, faculty, staff, and students who worked so hard to arrange today's programs. I especially want to mention Jennifer Puccetti, the executive director of our department, who worked with Paul decade after decade and accompanied him on so much of his work over this time. I so greatly miss Paul, but in the memories shared here today and the recognition of his writings, his vision, and his outstanding moral leadership and accomplishments. Um, I think today we've all felt his presence. Paul had a remarkable energy and resilience, and he leaves a powerful legacy for justice and care. He left us a critically important set of instructions, as so many today pointed out, a detailed plan to guide our work in the future to repair the world. Sometimes it's said that people have a smile that can light up a room. Paul lit up the planet and showed us the way. Thank you very much.